Steve DeBerg was picked in a round of the draft that doesn't exist anymore. He played for seven teams. His career spanned four presidents. His play action fakes were studied by Peyton Manning. He lost his starting job to a Hall of Famer in 1980. Three years later, he lost his starting job to another Hall of Famer. Then three more years later, he wrestled for a starting job with yet another Hall of Famer. He also backed up another Hall of Famer. He got his first MVP votes at the age of 36. He retired at the age of 39, became a coach, sent handwritten letters to teams begging for a job, then came back and played one season, becoming the oldest quarterback to start a game in NFL history. Oh, and he also wore a radio on his back during a game when he had laryngitis and couldn't speak loud enough to call plagues in the huddle? And that's not even the craziest thing Steve DeBerg ever did in a game. This is the story of the most interesting interesting NFL QB nobody ever talks about. And that's coming up right after this. Hey, if you want to build lean muscle mass, there's no mistaking. You need protein. Well, thanks to Good Chop, you and me can eat healthy, protein-rich, delicious meat. Good Chop gives you easy access for convenient, contact-free delivery right to your door. You can order fully customizable boxes, choose beef, chicken, seafood, and pork. And there's something for everyone. Grass-fed ribeyes, flavorful T-bones, wild-caught salmon, cod, even scallops. Hey, all products are sourced from the USA. Good Chop sources its meat and seafood exclusively from American farms and fisheries. So for me, I'm obviously gonna cook all of this, but this time I made scallops and they were freaking delicious and so easy to make. Butter, salt, and pepper, yum. So after this video, go to goodchop.com slash YouTube and use code 5points120 or click the link in the caption below to get $120 off across your first four boxes today. Again, go to goodchop.com slash YouTube and use code 5points120 or click the link in the caption below to get $120 off across your first four boxes today. Born in 1954 in Oakland, California, Steve DeBerg excelled in pole vaulting at Savannah High School in Anaheim, but moved back up north for college to play quarterback for San Jose State. He set records in 1976 and led the Spartans to a Pacific Coast Athletic Association title. He had the numbers. He had the prototypical quarterback size at six foot three, which was good enough for the Dallas Cowboys to drop a 10th round pick on him in 1977, but not good enough for them to keep him on the roster during a season when they won their second Super Bowl of the decade. DeBerg did not get a ring. Instead, he landed with the San Francisco 49ers, a team who had never sniffed a Super Bowl and had just hired an offensive coordinator from the Chargers by the name of Bill Walsh. Walsh was ready to test out the scheme he had spent years tinkering with as an assistant, the West Coast offense, and DeBerg would be his first lab rat in more ways than one. Unfortunately, it didn't go too well. DeBerg fired just eight touchdowns and 22 picks in his first year as the starter in San Francisco. In his first 26 starts from 78 to 79, he won just three games. But his weird career would get off to an even weirder start. With his job on the line in 1980, he couldn't speak for himself. DeBerg had contracted laryngitis in September. His vocal cords were damaged from a hit to the neck during a preseason game with the Chargers. A throat specialist told him the best way to get better was simple. Don't talk for a month. That's impossible for a quarterback who has to bark out play calls to his offense over the roar of 75,000 fans. But the 49ers had an idea. The Niners staff strapped a speaker, amplifier, and a power pack with four 9-volt batteries to the back of his shoulder pads and trotted him out of the huddle like he was J5. Vin Scully, who was calling their week four game against the Falcons, called him the hunchback of Notre Dame. DeBerg had an off switch in his helmet and a mini microphone on the bottom bar of his face mask that was designed by an electronics firm in San Rafael that charged the team 700 bucks. The system was fragile but powerful. It was designed to pick up the frequency of the human voice and could carry the sound up to 40 yards in quiet conditions. But in New York, during a game at the Jets, there was concern that airplanes overhead might drown out DeBerg's play calls. Yes, ironically, Jets. With their human amplifier at the quarterback, the 49ers beat the Jets. How is this even fucking legal? Dude had a boombox on his back. 
Nowadays, you can't even wear pink cleats without the league's approval. Bill Walsh even faked problems with the machine. And while they pretended to work on DeBerg, like he was in a garage or something, they sent in their backup quarterback to run a bootleg for a touchdown. That backup was Joe Montana, the third round pick out of Notre Dame and the future of the 49ers. DeBerg was not. But by the end of the season, Montana had staked his claim as the starting quarterback, and the 49ers traded DeBerg to the Denver Broncos in exchange for a fourth round pick. At first, he was backing up Craig Morton, who had led the Broncos to their first Super Bowl appearance in 1977, losing to DeBerg's old team, the Cowboys. But in 1983, Denver made a monumental trade to land John Elway, the rocket arm Stanford product, who had refused to play for the Baltimore Colts. DeBerg's days in the Mile High City were clearly numbered. Didn't matter that DeBerg won four of his five starts during Elway's rookie season, or that he had far better stats than the 23-year-old gunslinger. Like Montana three years prior, Elway was the future, and DeBerg would be moving on to his fourth team already, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The same year the Bucks traded for DeBerg, they also held the first overall pick, and in the 1984 draft, they pulled the trigger on BYU quarterback Steve Young. Young opted for the USFL, which brought in DeBerg time in Tampa. He put up the best numbers of his career for a bad Buccaneers team, throwing 19 touchdowns in 1984. But when the former first overall pick finally took the stage, DeBerg was once again left wrestling a future Hall of Famer for his role. Even worse, Young never panned out as a Buccaneer. DeBerg threw 38 touchdowns and 24 starts over two seasons, but the team was awful enough to earn the top pick once again. And they used it on Vinny Testaverde, and it was clear DeBerg was once again on the way out. For two years after being traded to Kansas City, DeBerg was unremarkable. 10, 10, and 1 in 21 starts from 1988 through 1989. While Joe Montana, who replaced him in San Francisco, defeated John Elway, who replaced him in Denver in Super Bowl 24, and then Steve Young watched from the sidelines. All three of them were at that game. DeBerg was still struggling to put together a complete season at the age of 36. Then it started to click. In 16 starts for the Chiefs in 1990, DeBerg threw just four interceptions and three of them actually came in one game. In an early December game against the Broncos, DeBerg outdueled Elway with three touchdown passes to lead the Chiefs to an 11 point victory at home. DeBerg, a career journeyman, finished sixth place in MVP voting in his 13th season of the league. In DeBerg's first playoff start, he was good, but not good enough. After holding a 13 point lead in the fourth quarter, the Chiefs fell by just one point to Dan Marino and the Miami Dolphins. Oh wait, did we fail to mention that he played this game with his finger sticking out of his skin? In week 15, DeBerg suffered an injury to his non-throwing hand, a dislocated finger that broke the skin. No problem. DeBerg had a pin installed in his hand and miraculously played an entire playoff game in excruciating pain and did not miss any games. One of the gutsiest performances of all time that would make Jimmy G cry just thinking about it. His hand looked like Booger McFarland's on a good day. DeBerg was brilliant at play action and watched games from the 1940s to master the art of deception. He was so adept at the play fake that his film became teaching tape for one of the game's legends. Peyton Manning. Bruce Arians called him one of the best ball handlers of all time, better than Jamal Murray's girlfriend. And when he coached Manning in Indianapolis, he used DeBerg's film from Kansas City to show him how to fool defenses. Clearly, Manning learned a thing or two in the process. By the time Manning had arrived at Indy, DeBerg's career had come to an end. Or so he thought. The Chiefs had moved on from DeBerg in 1992, and after playing 1993 with Miami and backing up the fourth Hall of Famer of his career in Dan Marino, he hung up the cleats. Oh, guess who started and won the infamous Leon Lett game? Steve motherfucking DeBerg. After retirement, DeBerg served as the quarterback's coach for the New York Giants under Dan Reeves. He was never planning on returning to football, but in his downtime, DeBerg's son Drew was entering high school and wanted to become a quarterback just like his dad. Steve, now in his 40s and five years removed from his last NFL pass, showed his son some drills and tossed the ball around and noticed his arm was the same as when he had been playing in the NFL. 
He thought he could still do it. So Steve DeBerg did what any rational person would do. He mailed handwritten letters to five different teams and eventually heard back from Dan Reeves, now head coach the Atlanta Falcons. When they spoke on the phone and DeBerg said he wanted to come back as a player rather than a coach, Reeves asked him, are you out of your mind? A few weeks later, he was a Falcons quarterback. The media and laughed and made ageist jokes. DeBerg realized the humor in the situation and said, this is not a normal thing for someone to do, but I'm not normal, so I don't really care. You can say that again. DeBerg appeared in the preseason and in mop-up duty early in the regular season, but when Falcons quarterbacks began dropping like flies, the 44-year-old was named the Week 7 starter against the Jets, a full 18 years after he had defeated the same team with a speaker system attached to his back. The start didn't go as well as it had in 1980, as the Falcons lost 28-3. Pause for effect. Still pausing. But the feat was untouchable all the same. Before Tom Brady returned for his 23rd season, DeBerg was the oldest starting quarterback in NFL history. In eight appearances in 1998, he threw three touchdowns and just one interception. Not too bad for an old dude. I mean, y'all, hey, old dudes are people too. Those Falcons made it all the way to Super Bowl 33, and DeBerg stood dressed on the sidelines as his former backup won his second ring. John Elway was drafted in 1983, DeBerg's seventh year in the NFL, and 16 seasons later, Super Bowl 33 would be the last game for both of them. At 45, DeBerg almost ran it back for one more year before blowing out his right knee. In a motorcycle accident? Instead, he became a private quarterback coach for the next two decades before full retirement. At age 70, he's playing pickleball, golf, and visiting his grandkids. Yeah, he's just like any other old timer. And that's the insane story of Steve DeBerg.